practice it over the last three or four years, I've actually increased my focus towards seed oils. And there was a 2020 paper published in the British Medical Journal that really explains why. Um, you know, if you have uh, fructose containing carbohydrates, they will still damage the metabolism. And that, that's really not in doubt the carbohydrate insulin model, you know, that we know what that all is. But seed oils have really avoided being held accountable for all the damage that they cause. So that this part study in 2020, it was a UK biobank study. It was a prospective study on over 195,000 people. And they basically looked at mortality and dietary factors. Now, number one, this is an associational study, epidemiology, so you can't prove causation. But I believe it is informative. And what they actually found that mortality, so they found that there was problems when you had too many seed oils in mm -hmm. terms of mortality association. They found that when you had too much carbohydrate, there was a problem with an increase in mortality. The interesting thing was, though, that they found that when seed oil consumption, a uh, percent of energy in the diet, exceeded 6 or 7%, then the seed oils were associated with more mortality than carbohydrates were. Now, if you consider this 6 or 7% and understand that in my country, the average Australian gets 13% of their energy from seed oils, you'll understand why this is, why this is really the elephant in the room. The seed oils are, are really the big problem here. And I think that, you know, for most people, if uh, low-lying fruits, um, if you've got a choice of reducing carbohydrates in the diet or eliminating seed oils, on the balance of probabilities, you'd probably get better health benefits by eliminating seed oils. So the, the fact that they're high in omega-6 is why that we see these surrogate markers of the omega-3 to 6 fatty ratio in red blood cells being associated with problems, but that's an association. The yes. causation happens via oxidative stress, the oxidative stress making insulin resistance worse, the oxidative stress causing fatty liver disease, the oxidative stress contributing to small, dense LDL. It's the oxidation stress that is the problem. Well, let's have a look at how this actually came about. You know, what, why do we believe that carbohydrates are necessary? It happens because in the 1960s, scientists developed a technique um, of measuring glycogen in muscles. And they didn't have much other technology, but they figured out that your high power performance deteriorated when glycogen levels were depleted. Mm. They also figured out that glycogen was made of glucose, carbohydrates are made of glucose. Therefore, it was obvious that if we just eat more carbohydrates, we have more glycogen, our high power, our anaerobic performance, our power performance, our strength performance is going to be better. And that was a paradigm which basically resulted from this one test, um, mm -hmm. the muscle biopsy for glycogen levels. And nobody ever questioned whether carbohydrates actually were needed to maintain glycogen levels because it seemed so obvious. Right. You know, right. glucose is glucose is glucose, you know, we, we don't really understand the, the whole physiology, but we don't need to study it because, you know, it's plain as day. The fact is, it's not plain as day. The single piece of evidence on which this whole notion that you need to have carbohydrates for high-level athletic performance hinges on glycogen stores. So in 2016, um, Jeff Volick was again associated with a study where they published a paper on ultra marathon runners. And basically what they did, they had um, some of the ultra marathon runners were ketogenic and they were well keto adapted. They'd been doing it for months and they had high carbohydrate adapted athletes who were used to being high carbohydrate. And then they put them on a treadmill, they made them run a marathon. And before they got on the treadmill, they did a muscle biopsy and they measured their glycogen levels. And before they started, they actually found that the ketogenic athletes had exactly the same level of glycogen in their muscles as did the low-carbohydrate athletes in the rest of the state. This is what you would predict. So the conventional theory is that after running a marathon, that the high-carb athletes would have higher glycogen levels because they would be consuming carbohydrates that are the race, so on and so forth. Um, what they actually found is that after the marathon, there was no difference in glycogen levels. And then after nutrient replenishment, 
in which the low carb athletes were given fat shakes and the high carb athletes were given carb shakes, two hours after recovery, there was again no difference in glycogen levels. It conclusively proves with biopsy level data, you, you, you don't get any better experimental data than this, that glycogen stores are maintained on ketogenic diets in long-term keto adapted athletes. So then the question rises, well, if this is the case, then you should actually see maintenance of performance. So ketogenic athletes shouldn't have any deterioration of power. They should, they should be able to generate the same level of peak force. So in 2018, McSweeney published a paper and basically they had high level athletes who were self-selected to one of two groups um, and they went on a ketogenic diet or a high carb diet for 12 weeks. And at the end of the time trial, they measured them. They did two tests. So one of them was a peak power. So they said, you know, they just measured what their peak power output was. And then another one was what they called a critical power test. So that went for three minutes and they had to sustain as high a level of performance as they could for three minutes. So a couple of interesting things. So on average, the ketogenic athletes did the time trial. They had a, a three-minute better time. Mm. They also had higher peak power outputs and they did significantly better on the critical power test. So clear evidence that ketogenic diets not only do not impair anaerobic performance, but it appears to improve it. 